Hurricane Sandy inching closer to our state right now, bringing with it extremely powerful winds and unprecedented flooding. Hi, everybody. Glad you're with us tonight. I'm Darren Kramer. I'm Don Lark, and Governor Malloy expected to bring us another live update on Hurricane Sandy in just a couple of minutes. Until then, we have continuing News 8 team coverage of the storm. Erica Martin standing by, but we begin tonight with Storm Team 8 Steve McLaughlin. Steve. Well, good evening. We are seeing those winds already go around to the north and east, and it will get nasty over the next couple of days. Sustained winds right now, generally between about 10 and 15 with New London up to 18 miles per hour, where we currently see a wind gust up to about 30 over the next couple of days, sustained winds at tropical storm levels. Those are winds above 39 miles per hour, and along the shoreline, we could be talking about winds approaching hurricane force, closing in on 80 degrees. For now, it is cloudy, a few isolated sprinkles, but there is a storm right now. That is Hurricane Sandy, Category 1, with winds of 75, officially 530 miles from New York City. Still forecast to come up, turn up to the north and west, and make landfall tomorrow night into Tuesday morning at about 2 a.m. in southern New Jersey, and then curl up and stick around New England for several days. Worst conditions here will be on Monday, the peak of the coastal flooding Monday night and Tuesday morning. And for more on the watches and warnings, here's Erica Martin. Steve, I do have those watches and warnings coming up in our full forecast. Right now, I want to show you some images that we already have taken by our meteorologist here, our WX Edge, Weather Edge meteorologist, Quincy Vagel. He uh, got this shot earlier at East ha uh, he, while he was driving through East Haven. This was approximately around 12.30 p.m. And I got to tell you, already seeing some flooding out there. So don't take this lightly. This just hasn't even started yet. Hurricane Sandy, Tropical Storm Sandy, whatever you want to call it, whatever it'll be by the time it makes landfall, is already making her presence known as we take a look at our Milford flooding already also taken by a meteorologist Quincy Vagel. We're seeing some light ponding across parts of Connecticut. We're also seeing uh, that we do have some flooding as well. So we do have the uh, shoreline warnings and watches. I have those coming up. But in the meantime, we now join Governor Good Malloy everyone. live at the uh, State Emergency Operations Center. As of right now, there Center. is no change in the weather forecast from the one that we discussed earlier today. As a result, we still appear to be headed for what is potentially the most serious storm uh, that any of us in the state of Connecticut has experienced. As I said earlier today, if you live in a coastal or low-lying area, and if your local officials have ordered evacuations, you, you need to listen to them. This is not a joke. This is a real warning of uh, a possible death as a result of drowning. I know it's hard to leave your home, especially when it could be for a, at least a few days, uh, but we could be talking about the difference between life and death. If you've been ordered to evacuate, then do it now. If you live near a river or stream that goes up and down with the tides, even a little bit, you need to keep a close eye on developments over the next 36 to 40 hours as well. Uh, let me see if I can put this in context. Right now, the most likely scenario uh, has a storm surge in Long Island Sound of 7 to 10 feet. Uh, we've seen estimates as high as 11 feet above typical high tide. Uh, that would lead to unprecedented flooding. To put it in perspective, uh, with Irene, we had a four-foot surge. So we're talking about a surge more than double the surge of Irene as a real possibility. In fact, the last time we saw anything like this was never, was never. Uh, for everyone else, take these uh, next few hours before the winds pick up to, cha to charge your cell phones, to make sure you have filled your bathtubs with water and to fill any uh, other containers you have with, uh, with drinkable water. Uh, make sure that you have fresh batteries in your flashlights and that you know where your flashlights are. Make sure everything on your property that isn't nailed down is inside. Make sure that you check one last time on your neighbors, uh, particularly if that is a senior citizen or a person with disabilities. After having consulted with the state agency officials uh, and our weather forecasters, I am now ordering all non-essential state employees to stay home tomorrow. Uh, this goes for all shifts. I am not a fan of the term non-essential, but that's the term of art that we use to describe those who are not designated as required to come to work. I'm also informed that, that the judicial branch has decided to close all of its operations tomorrow as well. So if you're designated as non-essential, stay home. 
If you're designated as essential, then report to work as required. Again, that goes for all shifts tomorrow. Later tonight, I will sign an executive order extending the time period in which you can register to vote. It was to expire uh, at 8 p.m. this Tuesday, October 30th. I am extending the deadline till 8 p.m. on Thursday, November 1st. Uh, as I do every day, I urge people to register to vote and to cast their vote on Election Day. I, however, I do not want people trying to register to vote uh, in the middle of a storm, and that's the reason that we're uh, extending that deadline. Uh, weather events happen, but our democracy goes on. As of this moment, we are still expecting the weather to deteriorate over the next few hours, and we're expecting that by midnight, uh, winds will really have picked up. Uh, from that point on, over the next 36 hours, we're expecting 40 to 60 mile per hour winds with gusts as high as 80 miles an hour. We have four tides that will occur during that 36 hour window with the worst one probably being the one that will occur late tomorrow night up and down our shore. Uh, unprecedented flooding is the likely outcome. As clearly as I can, let me say that if you do not have to be out of your home, and unless uh, it's a life-threatening situation, there is no reason for you to be out of your home, stay home as the, uh, the storm approaches. We will continue to update you as often as we can we can also, you can also call 211 or go to www.211ct.org or www.ct.gov slash Sandy. Uh, we have been uh, through bad times before, uh, all of us together. We've survived those times. Uh, this will be bad, uh, but we will survive this one as well. Uh, please, everyone, be safe. With that, I'll take some questions. Uh, Governor, you have uh, prior, in prior events like this, uh, compared this to 1938. Uh, and in 1938, the storm surge in the New London area was catastrophic. And we have since then built a lot of stuff, not the least of which is a nuclear power plant complex. Now, I know those things are uh, substantially sound. However, has the Dominion ownership communicated to you what the high wind and the high water might do in terms of flooding their building or, or having to shut down the one reactor that is running? Uh, as of the uh, weather forecast that they and we are dealing with, uh, the wind does not appear to be the difficulty. Uh, they are cutting energy back uh, to 75 percent and have informed ISO New England of that. They're prepared to cut back further or go off offline if that's necessary. Uh, flooding would not be um, uh, the, the reason either. It really has more to do with debris that might be in, uh, in the intake. Right. If we, if we lose, if a million people lose power, we won't need the, the generation capacity. Uh, anyway. you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, you mentioned about, about uh, moving ahead the um, uh, registration deadline for voting. We're extending it. Extending it. I'm so sorry. Thursday. Uh, what if large numbers of people still don't have power and roads are impassable on Election Day? We will cross that bridge when we come to it. Can you give us an update on um, uh, the federal declaration with President Obama? Uh, uh, I spoke to the President uh, earlier today. Uh, he uh, knew it was coming. It is in Washington, and uh, we await his uh, signature or FEMA's response. FEMA is on, uh, uh, is present now uh, with us and has been since this morning. Um, and uh, uh, the FEMA folks were on the call that I had with the president as well. What does a pre-landfall declaration do for you? It uh, uh, guarantees the coverage of certain charges and expenses um, and, quite frankly, makes it easier to, to move into the full declaration uh, uh, after landfall. Uh, any additional questions? Uh, whether there's a mandatory evacuation or not, should, should anyone um, on the shoreline, literally on the shoreline, be prepared to go at any time? Yes. Uh, even if there is not, uh, even if they're not ordered. Yeah, but 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 let, let's be very clear. So I because I want to. Uh, 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 we did something extraordinary earlier today. Uh, I convened a call of all our, uh, of all of the towns um, on uh, Connecticut's shoreline. Uh, we had representatives, I think, from all but two of those communities. I did that because I did not believe that people um, were taking this as seriously as they needed to take it. Uh, or that they understood the full threat um, that is present in this storm. Um, this is a storm unlike anyone that we've ever experienced. This is a hybrid storm, a part hurricane, part nor'easter, with, uh, uh, with record low uh, pressure uh, associated with it, which will drive a surge the likes of which uh, we have never seen before. 
Um, we have now conveyed uh, our concern to every one of those towns. We have urged them to use Category 4 planning, um, and we've uh, urged them to uh, 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 cause to be evacuated individuals who uh, are up to those Category 4 lines. Uh, that includes people who live al along rivers and streams that are uh, feed into uh, uh, the Long Island Sound because they too will be impacted. Um, uh, I, I don't know how to say it any clearer uh, that uh, then that this is the largest threat to human life our state has experienced in anyone's lifetime. Governor, what do um, you know, we're, we're, we're communicating pretty well. Um, uh, we have stationed uh, uh, military personnel uh, throughout the state, including uh, we've moved uh, 110 to Norwalk um, even this evening. Um, uh, again, our expectation is that each high tide over the next three gets worse. Uh, we did that because uh, we would not have had that many people available to that far western portion um, of Long Island Sound. Uh, high water vehicles, I've urged people to talk to contractors and, and others within their own uh, areas because we have, we have a limited number of resources. We will drive um, uh, those resources to those uh, areas most uh, hard hit, which we presume will be the waterfront. One leader of my community said he's afraid people don't get the idea of islanding in their own towns, being cut off and not being able to get escape. Uh, that is the reason why we have absolutely urged that evacuations take place now. Now, this is a very difficult proposition for people in Connecticut to wrap their heads around. We have, you know, a, a hurricane impact in Connecticut is normally 6 to 12 hours. We're talking about a storm that will play itself out presumably over a 36 to 40 hour period of time, including four high tide cycles. Each one of those high, side, uh, high tide cycles represents its own challenges. Currently, we're predicting the one tomorrow night is the most serious. Connecticut citizens' reaction will be, once any high tide starts to subside, they want to go back to their place. We can't get people out tomorrow night. That's going to be an impossibility uh, if we experience anything close uh, to what we're being told to prepare for. National uh, 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 coverage is now uh, currently talking about a 6 to 11 foot. At 11 foot uh, heights, we're talking about wave action covering dikes that currently exist in the state of Connecticut. I could not be any clearer, I, d I don't believe I could be any clearer, that anyone along the waterfront needs to take this seriously. Now that's on top of the fact uh, that large numbers of people will lose power regardless of the flood situation. Uh, and that's regardless of the fact that we also have a, a number of assets uh, which will be uh, challenged uh, to be protected, such as sewage uh, treatment centers uh, and uh, electrical systems, um, uh, regardless uh, of, of what happens with wind. This is a very serious proposition. Quite frankly, uh, uh, Connecticut stands to be the most adversely impacted um, of all of the states uh, in some respects as a result. Now, people will say, well, it's heading towards um, a New Jersey. The problem for Connecticut in this particular storm is the presence of Long Island, which we've never been able to move before. Uh, and, and the fact that the winds are going to force uh, large amounts of water uh, down Long Island Sound. Uh, and with periods uh, that are too short, we believe, to allow Long Island to, to, dr uh, to drain, and with a surge getting closer and closer and closer. This combination of events is what is a worst case scenario, is a worst case scenario for the state of Connecticut, at least those communities uh, along or near the water. That's why we're using the kind of language that we're using. What are the experts telling you with regard to this surge's impact upstream on the Connecticut, the Thames, the Housatonic, and all the rivers? The, uh, most of our river challenges, as, as anybody who knows Connecticut history, is water coming down. Um, um, the right. river. Uh, we are reaching out uh, to those towns um, and advising them um, uh, of the challenges coming up from the opposite direction. Uh, having said that, it, uh, with the exception of some very low-lying areas that, that, that uh, well, there are challenges and, and we're reaching out, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. And, and we want to make sure that, that people are, are aware of it. That's why I specifically in my statement referenced uh, keeping an eye on those streams uh, Are they as saying well. that the surge could come as far up as like Middletown? Uh, th I'm, there's, no doubt in the, there's no doubt that the surge will come up as far as Middletown. 
Uh, Middletown will be uh, impacted. Uh, no, Norwich will be impacted. Uh, 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 water heights as far as the Stevenson Dam on that river uh, will be impacted. That's a reality. Having said that, uh, we're, not, we're not sure that, that at this point that that would be worse than downstream flooding. Right. So they need to prepare, for instance, for as they would, would in a downstream situation. In other situation. words, the rivers are going to go backwards. Correct. That's correct. That, that, this is a no. This is a local obligation. We have rehearsed this. We have practiced it. We had four days of drills over the summer. Uh, these are local calls. You might say, well, why is it a local call? Well, they have the assets on the ground. They have the maps that we've provided them. We've directed them to use uh, Category Four, which is our highest category, uh, uh, for that purpose. Um, and I, I have to say that I think we're getting. Uh, good cooperation from the municipal governments, particularly following the 12 o'clock call, which was an unprecedented call. We had never done something like that before. Uh, I think people are, are on board and understand. How many people have been evacuated statewide? Uh, actually, in the Category uh, 4 uh, areas, there are 362,000 people um, uh, that could be impacted. During the uh, last storm, we had some uh, thrill seekers who really shouldn't have been out there. Do you have any uh, uh, words of caution for any of those kind of people? Don't be stupid. One more. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, a brief um, summary from the two utilities will be uh, lent to you at this time, and I think we've uh, spoken in, in as clear and plain language as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, and good evening. Uh, Bill Quinlan with Connecticut Light and Power Company. Uh, at CLMP, we continue to make very good progress uh, with our preparations. Our central emergency operations center and all 13 of our storm rooms across the state are now fully activated and uh, operating around the clock. A uh, primary focus this afternoon has been to ready our own fleet and personnel for deployment and also uh, the onboarding of uh, outside resources uh, across the state. Uh, our expectation is that uh, by this evening we should have 1,060 external line workers in the state ready to be uh, deployed. Uh, just to give you some perspective around that, that's approximately three and a half times the number of line workers, uh, external line workers we had available prior to the uh, landfall of Tropical Storm Irene. Those line workers will be deployed later this evening uh, to municipalities throughout the state. And beyond that, we are working uh, very closely now on uh, evaluating this flooding potential that the, the governor mentioned earlier. Uh, w essentially what we're doing is taking a hard look at our critical infrastructure that is in the flood zone if you expect a Category 4 flooding event. And it uh, goes without saying that the infrastructure that is most at risk from our perspective is along the shoreline. And there's two substations in particular. Uh, these are power um, uh, sources, basically. What towns in, are those? In Stamford and in Brantford. So we're at this point doing a very hard analysis of that flooding potential and taking all steps uh, reasonably possible to reduce the risk. We are also putting in place uh, plans to overcome a flooding scenario in, in each event. What, what are you doing? Are you sandbagging those substations? Yeah. Sandbagging is one of the steps we're taking. We're also installing uh, high-capacity pumping facilities. We are pre-staging uh, human resources in the area to deal with the situation. We are evaluating options for providing alternate sources of power into those regions if, in fact, we had to de-energize those facilities. So there's multiple steps that we're taking. And uh, we're going to continue to analyze that over the evening and be in a position to execute them tomorrow if necessary. You said you had 1,060 linemen uh, tonight, but th that's a lot less than you said you were hoping for on Friday. Your people said 2,000 on Friday. Are you having a hard time getting people here? We are making good progress against our target of 2,000 uh, external line workers. Uh, they continue to arrive daily. We processed many today. We expect several hundred more so they're on the tomorrow. Yeah. Many, are on, m many are on their way here to the state. Is it that you're calling and they're already heading elsewhere? Or? Yeah, so I think as we talked about earlier, I believe it was on Thursday, we put out a request for 2,000 line workers for Connecticut. 
and we've been working to secure commitments to have those line workers physically move to our state so it's a gradual process and we are making progress against that there is obviously a very large demand for line workers in the northeast and in the mid atlantic seven hundred tree workers yeah so as of this evening we expect to have five hundred tree workers available to us and by tomorrow we expect to have five hundred and fifty so that number will continue to increase over time so the 1060 is on the ground right now here right now the 1060 will be within the state available to us this evening and, and Branford the, the substation in Branford and yes. the one in Stanford are the only ones in a floodplain that you're worried about those are the ones that are most at risk based upon the flooding analysis and again we haven't actually had the event so we are looking at the ma same maps that the state is looking at and evaluating based upon our infrastructure where those flood heights would um, leave us and those are the two substations that have a, a material risk with these uh, 1060 obviously they all have to be paid and you're a regulated uh, utility what, what kind of money are we talking for this uh, stock? the um, these these uh, workers will be compensated, you know, in accordance with the, the contracts that are in place. I don't have an exact number for you right now with respect to what that is on a daily basis. But I mean, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be making commitments and bringing in people, flying in people from Seattle, if you didn't have a, a good idea of what this is going to cost. Yeah, at this point, our goal is to be fully prepared for this event. So we are uh, executing all possible steps, bringing the necessary resources for us to deal with this event. We do have existing contracts in place that govern the payment terms, but that is not our principal focus right now. Our principal focus is to bring in the necessary physical and personnel to deal with this situation. Could we hear from Mr. Preet from United Illuminating Company? Because I believe he has about seven substations that are in flood-prone areas. Absolutely. But don't go away, Bill. I won't. <laughs> right. Yes, uh, good, good evening. My name is John Freed. I'm the Senior Vice President of United Illuminating. And I just want very quickly just three subjects I'd like to talk about. Uh, first, I want to talk about our preparedness, and then I'll talk to you about what we believe and urge you to do as residents of Connecticut. And then finally, I'd like to uh, thank and, and get, make uh, our commitment known to you. So in our preparedness, uh, we now are staffed on the ground with more resources than we had at the peak of Irene. Uh, they're fully trained, um, and they're ready and committed to uh, resolve uh, any damage and to get you back as quickly as possible. Our main concerns continue to be the high winds that we'll experience uh, in many hours after the storm quite finishes. So we expect the high winds to be uh, in effect for 36 to 48 hours. Why that's important is we cannot put the linemen and tree uh, clearance workers in the field uh, with booms. It's unsafe. Uh, our other focus is indeed the substations, as Mr. Quinlan had talked. We do indeed have a half a dozen in the areas of New Haven, Milford, Fairfield, and Bridgeport. We're in constant contact with those towns and cities. We have plans to prepare for the flooding, and in the event there's flooding, to minimize the damage to the flooding so we can restore customers as soon as possible. As far as the governor, I'd like to reiterate, uh, as Connecticut residents, uh, I want to thank you in advance uh, for your sacrifice. We understand at the company that this is very difficult. It's a scary proposition. But we are behind CLMP and the workers uh, in Connecticut. We will restore as quickly as we can. I have uh, a message from our union president, Moses Rands, who, who said that his people are fully prepared and committed. Their preparation is interesting. They, they need to make sure that their families are uh, taken care of into high ground so they can fulfill the promise that we have for you. So, so in summary, it's about being safe. It really is. Uh, we urge you, if, if you have um, two, two decisions to make, to make the decision that, that keeps you and your family as safe as possible. I would ask, and I know this might sound odd, um, a prayer that no resident of Connecticut has any serious harm, a special prayer for the people that will be getting out into some very treacherous, very dangerous work in the coming years, or the coming hours, uh, that they can return very safe to, to the families that they're leaving. So with that, I'll take questions. Mr. John, Kelly. John, what are you doing to shore up or protect these substations at New Haven, Milford, Fairfield, and Bridgeport? Very similar. The, we have a, a bagging procedure all done, sandbags to prevent water from getting in. 
We will have resources uh, in the substations. We have pumps. We have measures. We will monitor the level of the water to the extent that the water gets to a point where it will have an electrical issue with the substation. We will de-energize. We have a plan that to the extent we do that, we'll, we'll do our best to backfeed the customers on other substations. We don't want a catastrophic fail failure to the substation. That would just uh, el uh, elongate any duration of the outages. Um, in addition to that, we have been in contact with ISO New England, who is the uh, operator of the bulk power system. They are tonight running dispatches, contingency dispatches. To the extent generation is needed, they will fire up generation as needed. Uh, you had talked about Millstone. They're certainly in the queue with that as well. Uh, line workers and any tree workers you have in your uh, on, on your current staff and then what you're also bringing in by tonight yeah we presently have uh, 290 line workers that are presently on the ground and approximately 200 line uh, I'm sorry tree clearance crews and we have a request for 600 uh, additional linemen and, and and tree clearance and that's through the mutual assistance and you expect those to be all on the ground tonight they are here already they are yes Can you tell go ahead uh, can, can you tell us, you, you mentioned about the safety and the booms going up, and I understand with the 40 mile per hour winds, et cetera, et cetera. Can, can you give us a, a, a time frame? Obviously, would, would during the storm, nobody whose power would go back on because your crews could not get out there. I mean, what, what kind of time frame are we talking about where somebody's actually going to get out there and doing work and putting wires up? Well, well certainly uh, Mother Nature is going to dictate that. Uh, 40 mile an hour winds, we, we can't even walk down the street with umbrellas, 40 mile an hour winds. I'm not going to subject my people to that. They will, of course, do anything that's necessary for safety. Uh, they'll, they'll make sure that the roads, as necessary, uh, will be passable. So on the ground, we'll be right on hour one. But we cannot send people in the air to do so. So if the 40-mile-an-hour winds last for 36 hours, I cannot throw my linemen uh, in harm's way, and nor will, will we, until such time as that gets diminished. Are those limitations written out? Those are safety limitations that, that, that uh, quite frankly, are governed by, by many safety rules. And can you just, uh, just to be, I know this will be redundant, but the importance of having generators installed properly when people start firing them up. Thank you very and much. And what I, the danger is to your people. Very good. So to the extent that you're out, uh, we understand a, a lot of generators came out, and, and that's great. Uh, we, we fully support that. Um, a generator, if it's not properly installed, and what that means is you cannot have a generator running with the main, the main in your house, uh, open, which means it's connected to the street. What it simply does, it will backfeed from your home and energize the transformer to a high voltage. Any line worker that is miles away will then be uh, subjected to that. So please, please, if you have any any um, uh, issues with generation, call us, call CLMP, uh, call the towns, and make sure that if, if at all, at all questions, that we'll have it done in a safe manner. And I, I would also add that uh, many propane grills, uh, obviously people will be cooking. Uh, we have had instances in the state of Connecticut where they're put in basements or, or garages, and of course that can't be done. You know, propane grills and things of that nature have to be very, very uh, far away from the homes or as far as they need to be to be safe. Thank you. I think you've exhausted us. Thank you. <laughs> There you go. Uh, pretty dire terms there from all three. The governor saying uh, we are facing the largest threat to human life in Connecticut in any of our lifetimes. And you heard the power companies preparing for what looks like an ugly storm. Well, and that goes right into the part two of what the governor said. Uh, prepare yourself for widespread, long-lasting power outages. And the utilities have been very careful to avoid any kind of time frame. Sure. That was the big mistake they made last time when they overpromised and underdelivered. This time they are not putting a time frame on it, but we know that time frame already is at least a week from the time they start probably 10 days out without power. Early to say, but if this thing blows for 36 hours or more before you can actually start to get workers up in the air taking a look at it, we could be in for a long haul here. Governor. Well, that's right, and, and the governor kind of opened the door there when he said uh, he was going to extend voter registration for the election to November 1st. The election, of course, the following Tuesday, November 6th, and Mark Davis asked the question uh, about the possibility that those power outages will extend through the election. Yeah, and we just don't know. Nobody no, knows and, th and that's what the governor said. We'll, we'll deal with, with that when we get there. Cross that bridge when we get to it. All right.
Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we have uh, live team coverage. News 8's Stephanie Simone, Jamie Muros standing by live on the shoreline. We also have New Haven Mayor John DeStefano live with us here in the studio. We'll be right back. Stay with us.